Welcome to another session with my tangerine tiger. Um, today we're going to push on and do some more destructive work on the machine before we start working on it to build it back up again. There are quite a few things that we've got to modify to bring this up to the same standard as my uh, China Blue over the other side of the workshop there. And so, you know, it's pretty straightforward stuff, some of it. But the first thing I'm going to do is one thing I really wish I'd have done early on with my China Blue machine, and that's get access to everything. I'm going to put an, ac an access panel in the side here. There is a, a natural divider across here. I've measured it, and we've got to uh, 295 millimeters, roughly, and that's where that piece of metal is inside. And what I'm trying to do, I'm going to put a door in here, which I'm going to cut out. And here's the frame for the door. Okay, now the door itself is going to sit on that line that I've marked there with my tape. And the screws are going to be below this panel that's inside here. <coughs> I've got to keep the screws below the panel because there's a cable chain that runs along and I can't have the screw heads interfering with the cable chain. And I need these screws up here out of the way as well of everything else. So there are natural obstructions in here which define where and how I should put this in. It's less important where this way, although when I lift this up and move the head forward, I've got to think about where my cutting tool is going to go in relation to the head and the cable chain. And just to make sure things don't move, we we'll just tape it in place. Now I'm putting in that, I'm locking that in place for two good reasons. First of all, I'm going to mark my aperture, and secondly, well, now I didn't waste the piece that came out in the middle here, because now I'm going to put that in there and just temporarily stick that in there. I'm going to use a proper drill to do the next bit. <clears throat> right, now we're going to start creating some dust inside the machine. I'm going to put dust sheet over everything inside the machine just to protect all the rails and the, uh, the mirrors and things like that. sharp edges and burrs. Put a 5mm hole through here. Oh, I don't want to mess up my new machine, do I? Look at that. A little bit of isopropyl alcohol. Restore it to full health back to pristine condition. I've invalidated the warranty I'm afraid. And what warranty was that did I hear you say? Okay so here's the plan we've got to our frame now and I've remade a separate frame because I wanted to cover up this little bit at the bottom here which is a bit uh, a bit rubbish and the idea is I've put four tapped holes in the corners of this frame. Plastic is not very strong and not good for putting tapped holes in but it's really only to hold the screws in and stop them falling out. And we've got plenty of access into here for messing around with the stepper motor at last. I can see what I'm doing in here. I can measure things. I can 
get access to things. Just put a cover on there so we can also see safely into the machine. Well at least we can see what we're doing now. So I have to say that this bracket is actually substantially stronger than the one that I had on the China Blue machine. The principle's still the same, but they seem as though they've made it of 16 gauge rather than 18 gauge. Right, so I've got the belt disconnected now, but it'll never go back together again until I drill some holes in here so that I can adjust the tensioners. Sounds like a bad idea. Why is that screwed in there? Okay, so we take that off and we can see what's in here now. That's rather alarming news. So yes, you can see the bearing block there. There should be two screws here and two screws there. Well, the two screws are there over the back, but there's no two screws here. So this bearing block has only held on with two screws, this gantry. I mean, it feels secure enough. Don't get me wrong. As I said, this is a relatively well-built machine. Here's the bracket that I made for the China Blue machine. Now, I'm pretty confident this will not fit on here because, first of all, as you can see, the pulley won't actually go through the hole. It's a much larger pulley on this machine than it was on my other machine. So let's just have a quick look what the heights are like. I think the heights are going to be OK. That sits on there. And this looks as though, yeah, that will sit on there OK. That looks perfect. So that height is correct. I've got to go and design a number two mirror bracket that takes the mirror at the right height and allows this larger pulley to fit in here and the bearings have still got to sit in there and allow everything to run clear. I just remembered that's why I've got this hole in the side here so I can get round to it because there's a nut in there which is difficult to get to. So we drop the stepper motor down. Yeah, and we've still really got to cut this bracket off. Now, as there's only two screws holding that gantry on, we've got this thing to come off here. This sensor is in totally the wrong direction as well. It shouldn't be facing that way. So we'll have this sensor off. Now I can get to the bearing screws. I've got to disconnect this cable chain. And now, we have a stepper motor bracket in my hand. And I can just go and cut that off there. <coughs> okay, so I modified the motor bracket and uh, I gave it a little coat of paint just to make sure that um, I didn't invalidate the warranty. I've put the screws back in, but hey, you can see that this this motor bracket be, can be mounted anywhere. Look, I can I can slide it around forward and backwards and wiggle it around. But even so, the one thing I can't do is move it in and out. And unfortunately, that's the one thing that I need to do to get this prototype bracket on. Now, this is the great advantage of having laser machines, isn't it? I can actually make a, not a working prototype, but a, a 3D usable model that enables me to check that I've got everything in the right place. It would appear to fit, but the problem is it could really do with being out there somewhere, a little bit further out, so that I've got room to get this plugged over the motor because of the bigger flange everything about it says yeah there's a bit of a problem so what I've got to do now look I've got about six millimeter difference there between where it was so I've got to redesign a motor bracket as well to shift the stepper motor out it won't affect the casing here because I'm not going to not going to increase the size of the bracket all I'm going to do is shift the motor further away from the gantry. I've got to make a Mark II version of my belt drive and mirror two holder because Mark I, which was suitable for my China Blue machine, is not suitable for this machine. Now, there's quite a few people that have asked me, can they have this unit? I think the answer is probably no, because 
it's so different than what I've seen being shipped today. This machine here I think is more typical of the machines that you guys might have. This one's got a very small drive pinion on it and this one has got a much larger drive pinion on it. And so I've had to do quite a lot of modifications here to get this mechanism to fit into this machine. Not difficult, but a complete redesign. I plan to send the Mark I and the Mark II along with the lightweight head and the one-piece tube holder with its mirror to Cloudre so that they can attempt to create the rust spec machine for themselves. So I'm making it easy for them by giving them all the drawings and physical parts so that they can play with them. I've already had quite a few inquiries about when is the rust spec machine going to be available from Cloudray. I can't answer that question, but um, what I can do is pass on your interest to Cloudray to encourage them to make sure it happens sooner rather than later. I, I make it completely clear to you guys I do all this work for Cloudray for free. It's not for free because I get the major enjoyment out of it. This is great pleasure for me, the engineering, solving the problem. That's how I see this. I've had the pleasure and I'm quite happy to give it away. But of course, I'm giving it away to a guy in China who has got morals. He's a great businessman, he's an entrepreneur, but he has morals and he sees me as a bit of a research and development arm. So he's giving me this kit. Okay, this is 2,000 pounds worth of kit here, which he's sent to me to modify a machine. So stand back from this situation and see who are the winners. Me, because I'm selfishly getting a machine, which I bought the machine and was gifted these parts, the expensive bits. So I've got a thousand pounds worth of machine and two and a half thousand pounds worth of kit to fit into it. So there's an idea, just an idea, of the total value of this package. It's somewhat less than thirty or forty thousand dollars that you might have to pay for a proper machine. We're going to see how close we can get to the proper machine with this venture. So I think that clears things up. I bought the machine, I was gifted some of the stuff, I give lots of things in return. And the winners are me. Mr. Cloud Ray, and you. Who's complaining? Right, well, let's get back on with the job. I'm going to be changing the timing belt in this machine. Yeah, I said timing belt because that's what these are. These are designed for transmitting power in one direction. I've mentioned before that these were never designed for this application, CNC machine precision movement in opposing directions. The problem with these belts, particularly this one, although there's no stretch in that direction, the problem is these teeth are a bit like a bouncy ball. When you bounce a ball on the ground, it absorbs the energy and then gives it back to you. Well, that's effectively what these teeth are doing. They're storing energy up from the stepper motor, which is doing this, and they're at certain speeds, they're producing a resonant frequency, which in a very small way, although you can't see it, is making this head vibrate like this. Coupled to that, as the teeth travel round the pulley, at certain speeds as well, they will exaggerate this situation. So we've got two things here working against us when we're trying to get smooth movement out of this head. To overcome that problem, which shows up as a curtains problem, these are lines in the background that actually represent the teeth on the belt. The teeth on the belt are actually causing the head to go stop, start, stop, start, stop, start, stop, start. And as the head stops, the power, which is constant, burns deeper. And then it runs quickly and it burns shallower. Deeper, shallower, deeper, shallower. So that's how these patterns develop on here. And it all comes back to a combination of the stepper motor which is a minor player, or the belt, which is the major player. If you run round plain pulleys, you can't have a steppy motion. So we've got a plain pulley that end, two plain pulleys this end, and the belt only ever runs around the flat side of the belt on these pulleys. And then what we're doing, we're driving on the outside of the belt with the stepper motor. And the other thing is, I'm changing the belt profile 
to a much stiffer belt profile so I don't get this bouncy ball effect. I've had this system working on China Blue for the last nearly three years now and it's still working extremely well and I have no hint of resonance. Now I hope that you might be able to see there the difference in the belt profile. Look at the tooth, look at the profile at the bottom here, the thickness of the tooth. The thickness of the tooth at the bottom here is wide. The thickness of the tooth at the bottom there is very, very narrow. So this is made from a much stiffer material called urethane, polyurethane. And as you can maybe see there, it's got multiple steel cores in the centre. So there's now not much more I can do at this end of the machine until I get a proper steel version of this. So I've got to get that away to the laser cutter now, that design, and get them made. The problem with laser cutting is there's normally a minimum order charge, which could be anything from 100 to 200 pounds, depending on which, which, which vendor you use. Um, because I use this vendor quite a lot for other things, um, I will be able to get, I don't know, I might be able to get four or five of these for 100 pounds. So that's what I should do. I should get a small batch made. So, you know, for those few that are really interested in trying this, I won't sell it to you until you've checked your machine. I'll give you key dimensions and if your machine satisfies the requirements of those dimensions, then yes, you can go ahead and buy one, but I don't want to sell you some scrap metal. Let's start taking a look at the other parts of the machine. One of the things that we do need to do is to get the mass of this head down. So we know how we can do that with the lightweight head. There's another problem as well. I mean, we've got extra weight down here and we've got inertia here in the form of this chain. I mean, this is, however you look at it, it is fairly free running, I agree with you, but this still represents a load as you move the machine backwards and forwards because this is something that's got to be dragged all the time. Okay, so I can't get the nozzle out. Oops, let's just take this brace off here, which stops the head from doing that. And if you take it off and start running fast, you'll get wobbly lines on your scans. So that's what this piece of material here is for. There's still no arrangement on here for adjusting the head up and down. Oh, they've reduced the weight by putting M3 screws in as opposed to M4 screws. Wow. Oh, and I had several goes at it as well. <laughs> okay, so now we've got the head off. As I said, one of the most useless pieces of tut that they build into this machine. And I have to say that when I bought my first machine, I was excited at having one. And that's this red dot pointer. It was supposed to be the best thing since sliced bread. Uh, no. Let's put that in the box of bits and pieces. Because we shan't need that again. Along with that. And that. Now, this thing here is useful for some things, but not on this machine. So, it's going to come out. It might seem like a small amount, but it's a, it's a load. It's a flexing load that's taking place here. It's continuously being bent. You don't bend things for nothing. It costs energy and it's mass. And what we're looking for this machine to be as fast as possible. So we're looking for the smallest possible mass that we can get in this head. So we've only got one thing left in that chain now, and that's an airline. I think I can do something to deal with that problem. Basically, I'm trying to get rid of this heavy old chain. Now I've seen various people with curly cables fixed up the back here, but, but they flop around as they fly backwards and forwards. I don't want that to happen. Let's take the cable chain off. I think we'll offer up the, uh, we'll offer up the lightweight head to start with, or at least the, the basic framework, and see what we can do with this piece of pipe, because this represents a small problem but it's uh, an important detail that we need to deal with. More bits for the junk bin. But we'll keep that bit because that's the, uh, that's the bit to fix the belt on with. Now that's the miracle of acrylic and laser cutting. I can quickly knock up what's in my brain in a few minutes and hey, we can try it. So first of all, we need to put a couple of M4 nuts in the back there. 
Then we put our belt plate on and fix it to the bearing. Don't do the screws up tight because they need to jiggle into the other holes. Okay, now we've got all four in, we need to tighten them up because we've got to find out whether this head is nice and stiff. Now we've got another M4 nut in the back there and one more M4 nut in the back there. And there we go, one more M4 by 12. Tighten everything up. Right, so we just lay that in there. That will be screwed in there, but we'll lay it in there for the time being because it doesn't really matter for what we're trying to achieve. We put the lens tube in and the butterfly clamp. What we're really interested in, does the back corner of that tube hit this M4 screw head? And the answer is no, which is brilliant. Because that means I can put a really strong fixing on there now. So we'll just clamp that in there for the moment. And then we'll see. I'm pretty impressed with that. That is lovely. That's not going to jump around. That's really going to work very, very well. That's another major problem. All I've got to do is build this. Isn't, that's not a problem. So let's just take a look at this other problem here, which is this one. And have I fixed it with this fitting that I've put through here? Well, I think that probably we've solved the problem. Look. Now, the only thing that's going to happen is when I push this to the back, right to the back. If I, if I happen to be engraving along the back there, it might be forward another 10 millimeters or so, but hey, look. We're not going to have this here anyway. I'm going to take that off and probably mount that underneath the gantry here because that's the right place to have light, not at the back there. patience and fiddling I think I'll probably come up with a solution. Now the solution involves making some special clamps like this. Now I've made these out of 10 millimeter acrylic but hey they're not really strong enough but they do the job to prove the point. So I shall have to get some probably some metal clamps made but not like this. Um, and what we're doing we're actually got the tube here and we're First of all, we're putting the tube into the clamp. Now that's difficult because it's six millimeter tube going into a three millimeter slot. But fortunately, this tube is very soft and it squashes with difficulty. But you can get it into the slot like that. And then you can actually slip it under the gantry. So the tube is now tucked underneath the gantry, not on top of the gantry. Okay, and here's, here it is coming out just here. What you need to do now is to take a look at this piece of tube as I move it from end to end. It doesn't touch. All it does is rotate 180 degrees. No load on that at all. And the, because this is your polyurethane tube, it can take all sorts of um, abuse. Neat, isn't it? On a hot day like today, that's hard work. You can see one of my intermediate solutions here, which didn't really work. Now, all I've got to do is to find a way of mounting this tube so that it comes down the front here because the position of the tube is pretty critical to get this to get this shape that passes over the head like this so we can cut it off and I could try plugging it in the front there I mean, that does work as well. 
It's a little bit of drag on this corner now, but again, the, the, urethane, the polyurethane tube will take that. So that's a pretty neat solution as well. And it then means I can plug that in the back. So there we go, another little problem solved. Taking all the weight away from the head. There's just the weight of the head now. And there's enough pipe in there. Well, here we are at the end of a quite a busy day. We've done actually quite a lot today and uh, ripped the machine to pieces and started putting it back together again. Look, this is the latest addition, the air vent in the front. Hardly shows at all on the lid. That's a job completed. The head is completed. The lack of a cable chain, that's completed. We've got the belt in the wrong way round, but that's a job that's there. And now we're waiting about a week for uh, the number two mirror holder and flexible rack and pinion bracket that I've got to bolt on the end there. Might be able to get the tube fitted in and ready. Might even be able to test it, but hey, I've got other things to do. But yeah, we've, we've made good headway in a day. We've designed several bits and pieces. So at that point, I think I'll go and have a nice cool shower and uh, I'll see you in the next session.